who are working in this field can provide the quality programming that is so desired and needed. How many of you would feel great if you could get up in the morning and do absolutely nothing? <laughs> yeah, I know. Some of you are like, yeah, I love it. And then when you realize what I was asking, you're like, oh. No, it's not fun. Maybe one day, maybe one day we would like to sit down and do nothing but maybe binge watch our favorite show. But guess what? You're still doing something. You're watching television. You're being entertained. You're, you're anxious because it's nice to binge watch because then you know what's going to happen right away. You know, and you're, not, and you're not involved in doing anything but binge, watch, binge watching that show. Again, you are entertaining yourself, so that is activity. You are participating in something. We're also going to look at some different uh, ideas that maybe you didn't think about. Some things also to think about. Why we, why we encourage activity interventions, why it is so important that we provide this opportunity for them, is because it provides this engagement opportunity. It gives them the ability to have a moment of pleasure or joy. So think about the things that you enjoy doing, whether it's reading a good book, again, binge watching that television show, going for a hike, maybe a walk with your, your pet, how do you, does that bring you joy when you do that? Do you find pleasure in providing that opportunity for yourself? Absolutely. So let's figure out how we can work with the individuals that may have a, a memory impairment of some sort. So here's the first thing that I highly recommend. Now this one you may see, think is very easy to do because hello, it's a family member, but if you do not know the individual and know what they truly enjoy doing, you're going to have a difficult time engaging them to do something. And that's the key thing there, is that we need to look at the individual we're working with, whether it be our loved one, our spouse, our, our parent, or a family member, that we have to understand what their personal background is. We also need to look at what is their cultural preferences. This is a huge thing to consider. Sometimes we look at different areas of the world. Now, I, I was raised in northern Indiana, as I said earlier today. I ate corn on the cob for almost every meal in the summer months. I would just walk across the street to my neighbor's house, pull off a couple of ears off their other thing, with their permission, of course, and we ate corn on the cob almost every meal during the summer, while corn was in season. I loved it. You could go to any corner and get corn, ears of corn for, um, we could get sometimes 12 ears for a dollar. Nice, cheap, easy meal, put a ton of butter on it, a bunch of salt and pepper, delicious, right? My favorite kind of meal. And of course, when I moved to Las Vegas and I could only get one ear for a dollar, it was very difficult to incur and enjoy something that I really looked forward to. I mean, you can get lucky. Sometimes you can find them like, what, six ears for a dollar maybe now, if we're really lucky. But I still enjoy that kind of meal. That's a cultural thing, if you think about it. How many of you love just having corn on the cob and that's it for a meal? Just a couple of us. And that's not very common to see that, though, with, with that, because that is a cultural thing. And that's what we have to look at is where were they raised? Because many times we, how many of you are native to Las Vegas? Anybody? <laughs> just a handful as well. Not very many people are native to Las Vegas. I always get questions from individuals asking me, what is the one thing about Las Vegas that makes it unique or special? The weather, that's right. Well, how, how can you have a party around the weather? Anybody have any ideas? How we can have a party? I keep wanting to walk in front, I'm gonna fall. <laughs> how do we have a party about the weather? A swinging, okay. I like that. What else? Any other ideas? A hot, hot, hot party? Did I hear that or no? A beach party, yeah, good. In Las Vegas, well, we have beaches. Ish. <laughs> we got Lake Mead. They have a beach. They have a rocky beach, right? A pool party. A pool party would probably be better, right? Good idea. So thinking about that, though, how can we incorporate what our culture is and what the individual's culture is? Then we need to really look at what their cognitive health is. This is a key thing, too. Now, we have many stages, many levels of dementia. And we understand, too, that some of us can know. We know maybe some of us already know right now we're in the stages of dementia. We're aware of what's going on. So that helps us. But when we get in the later areas of the dementia process, 
we're not going to remember that. And so this is why it's vital that you know these things about the individual so that you can make sure that you continue to provide that kind of activity, engagement, stimulation with them as they continue to regress into the, into the progression of the disease and the illness. Obviously, the things that we talked about earlier, like going for a hike. You know, we have some wonderful hiking opportunities in our, in our valley. So we have to look at that. You know, if the individual now has declined in their physical health and they can no longer actually hike, could we provide an alternative form of hiking for them? What could we do? Nature walk? Nature walk? Anything else? Anybody think? Walking paths. That's the key right there, too, because there's probably five different hiking areas. I'm not, I live in Henderson. There's probably five different hiking areas just within a five mile radius of where I live that have paved trails for the first you know, three quarters of the mile of the, of the hike. And it's an opportunity that you can, you can do that. Also looking at what their sensory capabilities are. You know, what, what do they like to think about? Sometimes we revert to a single scent when we are, are going through the process of the dementia. Like maybe they can smell different things or hear things, or even taste things, or touch things as time progresses, depending on what sense they're using. Then there's spiritual needs. Now this is, this is really a vital one that we have to consider. Now I'm sure there's many of us that do not attend church every single Sunday. So when I refer to spiritual needs at this point, I'm not referring to your church attendance, or what your church affiliation is, or what congregation you belong to. I'm, I'm referring to what are your spiritual areas of need. You know, nature walks could be a spiritual form of understanding. Getting out there and connecting with nature. That's a form of spiritualism. So recognizing what that individual likes to do. Now, I've, I've seen this many times too, so this is what we have to really think about. If mom or dad or, or um, husband or wife was raised in one faith, converted to another faith in their adult years, and then as the disease progresses, they revert back to whatever that original faith was. And that can be very, very challenging for family members. I had, I had a client that I worked with whose family member, the loved one that was going through the dementia phases, had been uh, raised in the Jewish faith but had converted to Christianity along their, along their time in their adult years and unfortunately had reverted back to their Jewish roots when um, they went through the process of the dementia. And the family member had a difficult time because the individual wanted to celebrate Hanukkah and Rosh Hashanah and all the high holy holidays that are around the fall time. And the family member did not want to provide that for their loved one because mom or dad was not Jewish when they were children. Mom or dad was Christian. And they could not understand the, con the conflict there. And so I had to go in and talk with them and say, this is where mom or dad is right now. We have to make sure that we're meeting their needs where they are right now. And we found out through research that mom or dad was raised in the Jewish faith. So then I brought in some Jewish uh, guidance for them and understanding to help them so that they could understand the process and be able to provide that. And they were able to do it, and it was really a great relief for their mom or dad because they were able to have some comfort and peace as they celebrated what they thought was to celebrate. <clears throat> Communication, too, is so vital. How do they prefer to communicate? Have you ever tried to talk to somebody who didn't have their hearing aid in? Is that fun? <laughs> No, it's not fun at all. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody who just stares at you and doesn't respond? And that's because they can hear. They just don't comprehend what you're saying. Something to think about too with, with a person going through the processes of dementia is that their comprehension starts to slow down. And they don't process as quickly as maybe you or I process. And so we have to look at that, look at that line there and, and recognize, okay, I just asked maybe a trivia question, like I had a client that I asked a question, let's see how quickly somebody can answer this question. Who, which president has a jar of jelly beans on their desk while they were in office? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, okay, good. See, you're all so smart, right? 
So I asked the question of the gentleman because I knew that he was an avid um, in politics. He knew all the presidents in the United States, and he didn't say anything. And he just kind of hemmed and hawed. And I, I paused for a good 30, 40 seconds. And then I finally went on to the next question. I said, who was a peanut farmer? And he stopped me went right after I asked the, the peanut question and said Ronald Reagan. It took about a minute and a half. So it took a minute longer than I had anticipated. And so I learned that. And so the next time I asked him a trivia question, I waited that minute and a half. And he is, if you want to time that, that's a really, really long time to sit in silence and wait. Just taking that into consideration, though, and knowing that their communication may be slightly different as they've progressed. Other things to think about, too. People who are living with dementia are people. This is the key thing, too. A lot of times we think of them as children or uh, uh, they're reverting back, you know, their childhood, and we talk to them in a different way, right? We kind of use a condescending tone, maybe, when we talk to them. Or we talk louder, thinking they didn't hear us or we do different things along the way, and we have to really look at that and recognize that there are mood changes, there's functional changes, there's preference changes, there's appetite changes that are gonna come through this process of dementia. And we have to be ready for that and prepared so that we don't make a mistake and cause what we call behavioral problems. Because behavior is nothing more than a means of communication when those words are no longer effective. So we have to really look at what is the behavior. Do they have to go to the bathroom, but they can't say anymore, I have to go to the bathroom. Are they thirsty? We're in Las Vegas, more than likely thirsty. We have a lot of issues with that. We have to be mindful of that, offering water all the time. I know like with my, with my mother, she never likes to drink water. And I'll tell you why, she's 83. Anybody want to tell me over 80 why you don't like to drink water? Yeah, you have to go to the bathroom too much, and that becomes a burden, so we don't want to do that. But that can be an issue with behavior. And behavior is always going to be something that they're trying to tell us. And guess what? You as the caregiver, if you're a caregiver in here, you cause 99% of their behavioral problems. Just in your attitude, in the way you come into the, into the room, on the way you present yourself, that causes the problem. So you have to be really conscientious of that and recognize, you know, it's really challenging when it's somebody you love and you're watching them going through this process and the emotions that you have have to be checked because that's where you have to really monitor yourself because you can cause a lot of that problem. So here's some things to think about. There's so many awesome benefits when it comes to activities and what we do, what we provide. So we look at this, you know, we want to enjoy a, a happier day of life. We want to increase those feelings of self-worth. These are the things that activities can provide for you. We want to maintain the memory as long as we possibly can. Sudoku is a great tool for that. Uh, crossword puzzles, uh, word searches. It has been proven that a word search actually provides more memory uh, functioning than a crossword puzzle. So looking through a book. And so as we talk about these different types of things that you can bring into play, maybe, you're, maybe your loved one never liked that. But I have seen individuals that get over the age of 75 that actually start to pick up that as a hobby. And it's okay to learn something new. You know, we talked about learning all of their past likes and their dislikes, but it's okay to engage something new, too, into that. Because new, we're always wanting to learn, right? How many of you have stopped learning? Yeah, just one person raised their hand. She's done. I'm no longer learning anymore. <laughs> over. We always want to keep learning, and that is a key here, that we make sure that we are constantly giving opportunities to learn. That we improve that and increase our relationships. That is so good, too. How many of you want to have a great relationship with, with your loved one that you're caring for? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's kind of a dumb question to ask, right? Because we all want to have this great opportunity to be with our loved one. Some of, the, some of the benefits that I have seen personally when it comes to the benefits of activities is it reduces a lot of tension, a lot of nervous tension. When we're bored and we're sitting there and we have nothing going on, we can become restless, right? And we can become, oh, irritated. Any of you ever had to be, you know, bed bound for any amount of time? Yeah, is, is it fun? No, we wanna get up, we wanna go, we wanna do, we wanna engage. 
And so it really, when we are engaging our brain, when we're getting involved and doing different things, it helps to relieve that tension that we have. It also decreases the restlessness that we find. And pacing. Pacing becomes a very common thing that a person that has the later stages of dementia uh, works on and doing often. We also look at how we can work at decreasing that repetitive behavior. Maybe we see a behavior that happens quite frequently and we want to learn how we can help stop that from happening if it's a bad behavior. <clears throat> and then it also helps if we're engaged during the day, we can sleep better at night. This is a problem in our town of Las Vegas. We're a 24 hour town. We have a lot of people who work night shift. How many of you ever work uh, day night shift? Yeah, it's not fun to try to transition your body back to the day and try to get a good sleep. How many of you get seven to eight hours of sleep every night? Uninterrupted. Don't have to get up and go to the bathroom or do anything, no, exactly. So we wanna figure out the ways to do that. I have a nine year old son, he's a very restless sleeper begin with and a couple weekends ago we went on a hike and we did four miles it's all I, you know four miles is round trip and I remember the next morning when he woke up from his night's rest it was the first time I noticed that his entire um, bed was actually normal like normally the sheets are, are are disheveled and the quilt is off and it was like he just slid in and slid out after his as his, after his nine hours of rest so activity can really prove that to be important and vital that we do that. I'm just going to share with you a couple of different concepts and you can find more information out on your own. They're on your handout. There's a handout on each of your tables if you want to look at. This first one I'm going to talk about was, in, was created by Dave Troxell and it's called the Best Friends Approach. Any of you ever heard of the Best Friends Approach? Oh good. Excellent. Oh you have. Great. Thank you. So we simply put, it is suggested that you become the individual's best friend. That's the key there. That you are empathizing with the situation, that you're remaining loving and positive, and you're also dedicated to helping that person feel safe, secure, and valued. So that's the key there when we look at this approach called the best friends approach. It helps you to see the individual differently. That you're looking at them from a different set of eyes, you're not their family member, you've become their best friend. Have you seen that before? I mean, sometimes we see often that we treat our friends better than our family, right? So we need to look at this concept of how we can be a better friend to our family member to help them cope with their, their environment, cope with what the changes are happening in their time, their mood changes, their appetite changes, their behavior changes, all of these things can help you in that process of becoming their, their best friend. So here's some things that they look at. Again, here we're talking about the personal preferences and their background, knowing each other's history and personality. So this is great. So not only will you wanna know your loved one's information and personality, it would be good for you to also share yours with them, okay? Whether you think they remember your lifestyle or anything like that, it's okay to start sharing that with you, with them. I had my mother-in-law that I, that I cared for when I was 20 years old and married to my husband. My mother-in-law became very ill with lung cancer that had already metastasized her brain. And on Christmas Eve, she had an emergency surgery by Dr. Lonnie Hammergren, how many of you remember him? And um, had an emergency surgery that did cause some damage to her brain, which, which led to memory impairment. And I remember working with her in our home and talking with her, and my husband worked the swing shift, and I worked the day, so we were all, somebody was always home with her. And I remember coming home from work and being really tired at my, at my day job, and working with her, and at the point, this point I was about six months pregnant with our first child. And we were talking and having a great conversation, and she started, her husband was in the Navy during the Vietnam War, and she started to talk like we were stationed in Guam at that time. And I didn't know a lot about her. I only met her when I was 19 years old, so I didn't really have a lot of time to get to know her as an individual. But I went along with the conversation as if we were in Guam together. And we had a wonderful conversation about two ladies hanging out at the home while our husbands were away doing their job. And we had such a great conversation. 
And I can tell you just a funny little story about, about her. As time progressed, you know, and I got bigger with my pregnancy and a little bit more frustrated, you know, as, as a caregiver does, we, were out, we would always go out on Saturdays to Walmart. That was our great outing of the week. And because she was wheelchair bound at this time. And we would, we would go to Walmart and do our little shopping excursion. And I would take the cart and go and work. And I would have my husband take her in the chair and just lollygag through the store. And um, I remember I was going and getting all the stuff. I was trying to move quickly. And he comes out up to me, you know, in the middle of the store. He finds me and he comes up and he wheels her up to me. And I'm like, oh, this is my place. What are you doing? And she says, you know what? I want to thank you for everything that you do for me. I see that you're getting a little big in your pregnancy, and you probably need some new clothes. So I would like you to buy yourself a nice new outfit on me for to help support your pregnancy. And then she says, but that other girl, she only gets a top. <laughs> that was me, by the way. I was the other girl, too. And it made me realize, oh, yeah, maybe I need to work on myself and be a better friend. You know, and communicate more and have more um, opportunities of conversation and not be so stressed out myself being the only caregiver to her. We didn't have any home care coming in or anything like that at that point. But look at that, looking at this opportunity to be a friend, to laugh often. I didn't laugh at the time, you know, of course, because I was really offended by it. Because first I was like, who the heck is the other girl? And then I realized, oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> and looking at that, you know, and figuring out, okay, I need to recheck myself. I need to look at what I'm doing and figure out how I can change my attitude so that we can have a better experience together. We didn't know how long this was going to last. We knew that it was not going to get better. It was probably going to continue to get worse. And unfortunately, it did. It did get worse. And I remember sitting with her, and at the, at the end of her life, she was admitted to the nursing home, and in fact, it was a nursing home that I worked at, so I didn't still get to see her every day. I remember sitting at her bedside and talking to her, and she just holding my hand and just loving me for being there for her. It was about a three-year process. And I just remember watching her go into the final stages of her life and seeing that I did make a difference. And that was very um, helpful to me to recognize how, how good it was to do something different. I got lucky, I guess you could say, because some caregivers can last longer than three years, right? And But being 20 years old to 23 years old, that was a lot to take on as a young, young, and then having a child, you know, during all of that. And it was really a challenge for me, but it really gave me the empathy that I needed to recognize how vital it is that we all become a best friend that we really look at them as a human being. Remember, people living with dementia are people. And looking at them as how we can take and value their, their work to, with us. And you know, as friends, we always work at that relationship, right? Maybe we go to lunch, we go to see the movies, maybe we go to a concert together, do different things. I have a best friend, every time Def Leppard's in town, we go. They're coming back again, if anybody likes, you know, we go to Def Leppard. And, and I'm really looking, she already called me and said, I've already bought her tickets, to send me your money. I'm like, okay, great. So it's just really fun to look at how we can move together and become this friend with them. That's a hard thing to do when we're family. So just reiterate, you know, we treat our friends better than we do our family. So let's look at this individual as a friend and, and, and learn how to reevaluate our own mindset of what we're gonna do. Other things that we look at, too, is we want to recognize that there is something out there called the basic rights of a person with dementia. We've heard of our basic human rights, right? We've heard of all of these things, and there are some written in our human, our rights of a person with dementia. And that's part of the best friends approach. That we need to understand what it's like to have dementia. Who has been diagnosed with dementia in here? Just one person? Okay. How many of you understand what it's like to have dementia? <laughs> maybe, maybe just a little bit. Maybe we have a tiny, tiny speck of understanding of what it's like to have dementia. That we really use that individual's life story so that we can understand who they are. 
And we have to know what to say when that communication starts to break down, because that's going to happen too. Communication is not going to always be there. We're not going to be able to verbalize back and forth. We may have what we call nonverbal communication happening. And so we need to look at that process too, of how we can understand and read body language and know what they're trying to tell us through their body language. And then we need to develop a knack of great dementia care. So what would be considered great dementia care? Probably going back to their concept of being a best friend, of just being able to focus on them as an individual. Don't worry about little things that happen along the way. Episodes, as we call them. Problems, maybe you're doing twice as much laundry as you wanted to do. You know, maybe you're looking at having to clean up the kitchen more frequently than you want to do. Those are things that can get in the way of being a good friend and understanding how to have that great knack of good dementia care. We also want to experience meaningful engagements throughout the day. This is, you know, one of the things that I have an issue with personally is when I come into a home and the individual is just sitting on the couch watching television the entire day. This is not engagement. This is not fulfillment. Granted, we talked about that at the beginning, you know, if we binge watch our favorite episode, we're going to be all gung-ho and excited about who shot who. I remember back in the 80s, don't you remember the uh, thing of JR? Who shot JR? We had to wait an entire summer to find out. And then wasn't it an entire season later he shows up in the shower alive? I mean, come on. Big dream. Now we can only have to wait five minutes, right? But that is not engagement when we do not understand what's going on in the television. Or we don't focus on it anymore. Live television can be really challenging for somebody that has dementia. Why do you think that? Anybody have a thought? Over here. Right. Right. Thank you. Good. Yeah. So she said they didn't, couldn't process it, probably. What's happening? You said again? Confuses them and they go into make believe. Short time span, right? And also with live television, we have those little things that we forget about when we binge watch, they're called commercials. And um, those commercials can wreak havoc, especially if we're seeing a bit from the local news, another person murdered down on the strip, another elderly person killed in the crosswalk. You know, all of these things can trigger, trigger behaviors. We don't want to have that happen. So that is why I don't believe in television as a live aspect. I believe in movies. I love like great movies, musicals. Um, I, I don't know if there's anybody, I'm still an avid fan, you know, Lawrence Welk shows are still on every Saturday night on PBS at 6 o'clock. I still watch it, not every weekend, but if I'm home and on Saturday night, I, I record it, I love it. Those are things that we can bring into the, the home if they like that. Um, Keep on is probably the next level up, or, or the Donnie and Marie show. Who, who knew that Donnie, oh, I better not give that away if somebody is watching The Masked Singer and hasn't watched it yet. Um, different things on that. But there's always good programming, and yes, but if you want to have a good opportunity of watching television and engaging in television, sit down with them, watch the show with them, fast forward through the commercials if at all possible, have a conversation about what's happening on the show. That's engaging when you watch television. Other things that can be engaging, and we're going to look at them coming up, but it's just different things. You know, having those meaningful experiences throughout the day. Having little snippets of conversation. Short attention span was mentioned there. That's the key there is to think about that. You know, how long do you think you can engage an individual in a conversation? Maybe three to five minutes. And that's good. That is good. Sometimes you can go a little longer just depending on what the topic is, but that's okay. That's really a good thing to look at. Other things to consider with that is that every person with Alzheimer's disease or dementia deserves to be informed of their diagnosis. This is the key thing here. We do not keep anything from them. I had an individual that would ask me every day, I think I have Alzheimer's disease. Do I have Alzheimer's disease? Yes, yes you do. Every day we went through that, sometimes three times a day. 
The question was asked, I think I have Alzheimer's disease. Do I have Alzheimer's disease? Yes. Yes, you do. But thinking about this too, is we want to have appropriate, ongoing medical discussions, medical care. Just because the individual gets diagnosed is not a death sentence. And we used to think that probably 20 years ago, that, oh, life's over. No, but I have seen individuals that have dementia do amazing things, continue to live their life. We're going to look at some of that here coming up too, to understand how good it is to continually learn, to grow, to develop, doesn't matter how old you are. That the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, is not relevant when it comes to human beings. We can constantly learn, we can constantly grow, and we can constantly engage. We want to treat them as an adult. That is really vital. They have their, uh, afforded the respect that we need to give them. We respect the individual. We can get frustrated with some of the behaviors that occur, but we still respect the individual. To be with individuals who know their life stories, including their culture and their spirit, spiritual traditions, and to experience that meaningful engagement in the day and have a safe and stimulating environment. This is vital too, that they feel safe and secure. Um, I have, my sister-in-law's mother passed away a couple years ago from her diagnosis of dementia. She had vascular dementia. And I remember when, when the process started, I was actually with, with her. We were working at my sister-in-law's home. It was her daughter's uh, wedding reception and they had it in their home in the backyard and we were in the kitchen kind of putting the food items together and, and, and doing different things. And I, I was watching her mother and I, I'd grown up with her mother. I'd known her mother for years. And I was watching her mother and she was just doing these teeny little quirks, you know, teeny little things that were happening. And I said to my sister-in-law, have you had your mom looked at lately? She said, what do you mean? And I said, well, your mom is starting to show me, show me that she has the beginning stages of dementia. No, no, she doesn't. She's just forgetful. I said, well, but she's doing some things here that I was, I was starting to recognize. And I'd already had a long career in dementia training and, and, and validation and things, and I just said, you really need to have her looked at. And it was probably two years later when she called me, my sister-in-law, and said, we finally had mom looked at, and you were so right. And now she's to the point where we really can't do a lot but just let her live her life and figure out how we can provide the best care that we can for her. And she, her mother would read the newspaper every single day, the same newspaper over and over again, talk about the same headline all day long. And it used to frustrate her husband, who was still alive at that point, how um, frustrating it was for her and him, because he would be like, you just shared that story with me. I already know. Or she would pick up a newspaper that was three days old and read the headline and talk about it. But that was something she enjoyed doing. And so I went in and I talked with the husband, with, with um, my sister's father, and I did a sister-in-law's father, and I just said, listen, you've got to just let her talk. I know it can get really annoying for you, but just agree. It's very easy enough to agree. We, can, we always say we should agree to disagree, right? But we can just say, oh, that's interesting. And even if it's 25 times, oh, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing. Oh, that's interesting. Thanks for sharing. You know, or doing different things or having a conversation about it. But just making sure that the environment is safe for them so that they can feel comfortable. And of course, it got to the point where she could no longer be in her home. And um, I, I don't know, some of you may have heard this before, but her husband was also diagnosed with colon cancer along the way. And he, we knew that his life was, was imminent. And so my sister took it upon herself, my sister-in-law took it upon herself to move them and her family at the same time up back to Utah where they're from. And because that's where the cemetery was, and so they didn't want to have to pay all these fees, you know, to transport. They got her into a home, and I remember it was a long journey from Southern California all the way to Northern Utah. And they did it in one day, and it was very, very stressful. I don't recommend it. And I remember when they pulled into the hospital parking lot that had the, the nursing home and the memory care center on the same campus. And her mother sat up in the back seat and said, oh, heck no, are you taking me here? Because she worked as a candy striper at that hospital when she was a young girl. She recognized it and she said, you are not leaving me here. She had said nothing along the way. Or they would say, mom, look at the mountain. Oh yeah, that's nice. 
And then she sat straight up, and it was midnight when they arrived, and said, you are not taking me in there. And she didn't use heck. I was just being polite. And I, I just remember her calling me and telling me this. I cannot believe my mother remembers this place. I cannot believe it. I said, that is a childhood memory that you triggered by taking her back to her childhood home. And she, you know, unfortunately, a couple weeks later, her husband passed away. She's still living today. She is, is now in a veterans facility, and it's hilarious because she is the woman on the town, let me tell you. The men love her. <laughs> if you, if ladies, if you want to have a good, good life towards the end, go to a veterans home to live. <laughs> I walked in to see her, and I was talking with her, and she said, that's my boyfriend, that's my boyfriend, that's my boyfriend, that's my boyfriend. And I said, good for you. Good for you. And when that first started, my sister-in-law called me, Mom is doing this and that, and she's kissed another man. How will my father feel? I said, I don't think he's going to realize that it's, okay. it's fine. It's fine. Does she know what she's really doing? She's, she finds love and affection. Remember, we have are those five languages of love that's been out there. How do we show our love? And that's how she shows her love. And I said, but that's okay. Kissing somebody is showing love. She says, well, what if it goes further? What if it goes further? We'll, we'll cross that bridge when it, we get there. It never went further. She just likes to kiss the boys. <laughs> <laughs> but also need to say, oh, being outdoors on a regular basis, that is really good, too, to look at, understanding that. And then this one's really a difficult one, to be free from psychotropic medications whenever possible. This is a key thing. These are what we call in the business chemical restraints. That's what we call that in the industry. And these can be very detrimental to somebody. Again, remember, behaviors are nothing more than a means of communication when words are no longer effective. So we really need to investigate what is causing the behavior. What is triggering that behavior? Looking at how we can change or help improve that behavior before we put them in on antipsychotics or anything like that. Antipsychotics are not made for the elderly. They're not made for an older individual, and sometimes we can overdose them with that, and they get to the point where they're in, they're in their bed and there's nothing there, because they've been what we call snowed. And we don't want to do that. We want them to have their life, to be able to engage. Now, I just said, whenever possible, there are going to be times where, yes, you may have to use these types of interventions, but I would make sure that it's the last possible choice before we get to that moment. Also, like I talked about, physical contact is so vital. Hugging, caressing, hand holding, putting the hand on the shoulder and rubbing their back. Granted, if you already know the individual, then that's gonna be okay. If you, uh, if you don't know the individual and you're like a personal caregiver coming in, you need to establish that relationship before you take it to that level too, to recognize that, is that gonna be something they want? A person with dementia has the right to be an advocate for themselves. They have the right to make their own choices and their own decisions. They may not be the choices or decisions you would want them to make, but they have the right to do that. Granted, you know, we had uh, Ms. Boyer here talking about how important it is to have, you know, certain documents in place so that when it does come to the point where they cannot medically make their own decisions, then yes. But if up until that moment, they should be allowed to make their own choices. They should be able to do what they want to do. That they can be a part of their local, online, and global community. That they can be active, engaged, and involved. And to have care partners that are well-trained in dementia care. There's lots of opportunities to learn more about dementia and how to care for them. And the AFA, who's here hosting today, has a great resource table back there. This is filled with information on how you can work with your loved one and understanding the diagnosis. So, I asked you this question earlier. How many of you know what it's like to live with dementia? This is a great little presentation that I share with my students when they're going through their training process that I brought with you today to see dementia from the inside. Is there sound? I'm sorry. Look at those hands. 
years. I still feel like I'm 18. I don't know, I think I've been 18 for a while now. Oh, I'm here again. I recognize some of my favorite pictures. Oh, that's me and Alison. They look such a pair. Oh, something's changed. Concentrate. this picture. It's, uh, oh, who is it? The faces seem so familiar. So familiar. Why is it dark? I don't remember going to bed. What's that? Voices? Alison, is that you? Count sheep. Go to sleep, count sheep, count. Hi there. Who's this? What's he doing in my room? I'll have a tea. Here you are. Go back. No, hold on a minute. There's something familiar about him. Oh, come on, who is it? It'll come back. Here's your breakfast. Oh, that's better. What's it called? Oh, Fusely. I used to cook something with this, but what was it? Don't, don't, don't! Oh, Static. I used to be the chef. I used to make breakfast for hundreds of people every day. Now I can't even help myself to my own oh, breakfast. Let's get the other one back. Who is he? Why is he in my room again? What's he going on at me about? Leave me alone. Feels weird. Oh, that was scary. I think it's sitting here looking at the garden. It's probably my favorite thing to do. It's so lovely in the summer. It looks a bit flat now. I could do with getting out there with Amy to tidy it up a bit. Oh, it was so funny when I went out there and got away in one sandal. I thought Amy was going to wet herself laughing. What am I like? That used to scare me so much when things like that happened. Not so much now. Just remember, things will come back properly if I wait and keep calm. I remember the first time it happened. I was outside Jones's in town. I just couldn't find it, even though I'd been stood right outside it. Then, when I did see the name, the letters started falling off. Just fell off, they did. Drifted down. I thought I was going mad. Cold, yeah. Let's get you back to your armchair. It is a bit cold. 
Tony really looks after me. He looks so sad sometimes, though. What is it that makes him worry? Hungry. Can I have my uh, slipper? What? No! Can I have my slipper? These are your slippers. No! My slipper! Oh, For God's sake, my slipper! I'm hungry! It's not time, you. I want my slipper! I want my slipper! I want my bloody slipper! <sighs> Now I've upset Tony. Oh, at this rate, I'm never going to get my supper. Oh, supper. Oh, that was my fault, wasn't it? What an idiot. Why do I upset everybody? I'm useless. I love these old pictures. I think that's Alison. I'm not sure who that other girl is, though. I'm feeling a bit better today. There's so many things that can be happening in their mind. You saw how it just showed how many different times something was happening different in their mind and recognizing what was happening around them. There was a brief, brief moment that she recognized her husband and then she didn't. Then she also asked that question, which I always find really sad too, is why is he so sad? He always has a sad look in his mind. I don't know, I don't understand. Looking at that understanding of, under, of looking at that. Any other questions or thoughts on that? All right, good. Yes? Have you tried that virtual uh, reality? Yes. What it's do good. You think about it? I, I think it's great. I think it's really fun to do. He had asked about virtual reality, and um, you look at different things. You can have your, uh, your iPhone or your other phone, your Samsung phone, anything, and it goes kind of like into a pair of goggles. And you can put anything up on the screen and it's like you're already there. And it's really cool. So you could be walking around that. We just, I just did this uh, study or just showed the study of this, of this organization that's now doing virtual reality bike rides with their, with their individuals that have dementia. And they put them like in this dome thing and they do have pedals, but then the screen in front of them goes into the countryside and everything. And they don't have to pedal. They can just sit there and pretend like, or you know, not pedal at all, but then they have the ability to go and do. I think it's really a good one. Um, my husband was a software engineer for Sony. Uh huh. And he was telling us to go to the company and like we stay at a uh, yeah, like theater and all kinds of places. Okay. And they're really invested in the VR. In the VR and the virtual reality, good. Excellent. I think it's really good. One of the things that you can kind of scale it to now, how many of you have ever done a Google map search on your old child at home? That's something that you can kind of do that's kind of VR-ish too, but it takes them back, it gives them the opportunity to see where they used to live if they weren't from Las Vegas, um, and, and have the ability to have a conversation as well. I think virtual reality is probably the way of the future and making sure that we can have interactions without having to do pay a lot of money to travel. You know, if you wanted to see the world, there's great websites out there that also have um, like video presentations that you can watch of different museums around the world. So if you are a museum lover, you can go in and, and see the pictures that are hanging in the in the, the, the Louvre and, and seeing all the different things in the Louvre. The Louvre. I can never pronounce it right. I can spell it right, but I can't pronounce it. <laughs> and doing different things so you could have, have an opportunity to engage in an art exhibit without leaving your home. Different things like that. So yes, I think it's good. So when the person with dementia forgets their past, the best friend that we have here is the one that does the remembering. This is why it's so good and vital to know what the individual's past was all about, recognizing that, like she talked about in that video, 
Oh, we used to go out on the motorbike. Do we still have the motorbike? Let's go for a ride. Doing different things like that. That's where virtual reality could come into play. You know, if we physically cannot sit on a bike anymore, on a motorcycle, then let's do a virtual reality ride and have that opportunity and, and doing different things. So maybe you can recall those happy stories. Pictures always create memories. Remember, a picture is worth a thousand words. So having that, but knowing what's going on in the picture, knowing who the individuals are, like she said in the last final phrase, you know, oh, there's Allison, but I don't know who that other lady is standing next to her. Well, that other lady was probably her. And recognizing that too. And then you can have a conversation with her. Well, that was you and Allison back in her heyday. We were having a good old time. And we, you know, this picture was taken while we were out on that motor ride through the country. And we stopped and, and took this photo and having that opportunity. Because this will give you those tools that you need to have in your toolbox to help to redirect the person. To bring them back to where you are. And, you know, maybe somebody loves to bake. I like this one. Can you show me how to make an apple pie? <coughs> Teach me how to bake an apple pie. Or let's learn if they don't like to bake. Maybe it's something new they want to learn because we, maybe we're watching too much uh, cooking channel, you know, and we get excited and zealous. And let's learn how to bake something. Let's do it together. And then knowing what to say when communication breaks down. Remember that damage can cause uh, the inability to have a conversation. So we're going to have to constantly engage in that conversation, bring up topics of interest, try to work with creating the story that's going to go with that, and showing how we can be present with that person while we're going through that, that opportunity. So we want to do, you know, what we look at. Mac, we talked about this earlier, but that's the part of doing difficult things with ease. So it just kind of like rolls off, no problem. You know, we're easy enough to, to take this, this experience. You know, we don't know how to make an apple pie. I'll just refer to that. We'll just uh, pretend like we do. and We have that knack and we just do it. How many of you watch those BuzzFeed videos over and over again and show the, how they quickly make something in a matter of 30 seconds or less? Yeah, because that's what we do, you know. I think of Pinterest, too. How many of you Pinterest? How many of you are on Pinterest? That's a waste of time, isn't it? Because we can really go on there, and, and I love, though, there's a new show now on Amazon called Fails, Pinterest Fails. Have you seen that one? Or not Amazon, uh, Netflix, where you can watch people try to imitate what they watched on Pinterest and how poorly it was done. <laughs> like, you know, you want to make that cute little Easter-shaped cake for Easter time coming up. <laughs> and, you, and Pinterest has it looking like this glorified cake, like they're on the Cake Wars channel. And your cake looks like, we don't know. We don't know what it looks like. We're just gonna pretend that it's a, a wrap. <laughs> so I like this too. So if the person says, boy, George Bush is an excellent president, he's doing a great job right now. How would you respond? Yes, he is. That's right. Yes, he is. He's doing a great job. <laughs> just thinking about that too. Not arguing with them, knowing, and then you would have an idea of where they are. You can even ask the question, is it senior or junior? And then you can find out, okay, George Bush Sr. was our president during this time frame in the 1980s. We now know where they are in their mindset. They're in the 80s. And then you can have conversation about fads, trends, whatever happened during the 80s, or where they were in their life during the 80s. Were they working full time? What job were they working at? You can talk about their career in that or what animal they had at that time, or who their friends were, or what hobbies or interests they did then. Because we all change as time progresses what our hobbies and our interests are. And so we can engage in a conversation, and now that just gave you a great clue as to where they are. Now if they said to you, Abraham Lincoln is doing a great job, <laughs> you know something's wrong, because they didn't live during Abraham Lincoln's reign, or <laughs> tenure as he was our president. So then you can talk about that a little bit more. Why would you think Abraham Lincoln did a great job? Just say it like that. Don't even say, well, Abraham Lincoln's not the president today. You can say about different things, but engaging in a conversation. Experiencing meaningful times. So making sure you're living in the moment. This is a key thing, too, is to recognize being in the moment. So this one can be really challenging, too. So like if we are making that apple pie, and your loved one who is suffering from dementia just up and quits and walks out and goes and sits down, okay, pie making's over. Let's no longer force the issue anymore. 
You have a choice. Me, I'd probably just throw the rest, the rest of them away. I wouldn't continue either. I'd go sit down too. But maybe you would want to finish making the pie, and then you can have that pie, you know, the sensory of the pie, the smells when it's baking, and all those different things, and that could trigger to bring them back to the pie making opportunity. But not engaging in a conversation where you are, or more of an argument, I could say, where you're frustrated because they've left the room and left you to finish the work. Especially if you decide to make the pie by peeling apples to begin with, and boiling them. And now they're on the, you've just peeled one apple and they're done. Need more than one apple for the pie. That's why you just buy a can of pie filling and have it ready just in case, right? <laughs> finish it up. <laughs> but just doing different things. Or, you know, taking a short walk, chatting, offering a hand massage, or doing the simple chores together. People want to feel like they are worth something and that they have a responsibility. That is so important, too, that we give them opportunities to work and be responsible for something. There's not going to be, I know we always worry about the damage that may occur along the way. You know, how many dishes are going to get broke if they set the table? Does the fork get placed on the left side of the plate or the right side of the plate? Does it matter if the fork is set at the top of the plate? Is it on the table? Yes. Did the dishes make it there without breaking? Absolutely. And if we lose a dish, oh well. Unless it's mom's fine china. Then I always recommend don't use mom's fine china during that process. You can be like all of my friends. I don't know. I mean, I have a lot of a lot of gal, gal pal friends that like to use just paper plates. They're a demon. You don't even have to worry about it now. Nothing gets broken there. Just throw it in the trash. <laughs> So using the language of friendship throughout the day, you know, looking at that, developing that authentic relationship, and it creates a caring opportunity that everybody's going to benefit from because you've become friends. That's vital too. Now moving into a different concept, this concept was uh, developed by Jolene Brinke is her name, and she developed what we call creating moments of joy. And this one I really like too, because she says that the individual Re allowing them to relive, relive those past simple press, uh, pleasures helps them to be in the moment. I've talked a lot about being in the moment, and this one, Jolene, takes this really to heart and how we can look beyond the challenge of memory impairment. We want to look at how we can decrease that process of being frustrated, just creating an opportunity to have a joyful experience. That is vital when we look at creating moments of joy. I talked about this earlier, too, that 99% of their behavioral problems were because of what you did. So this is what you have to really look at, is your mood can affect their mood. I always think of that old saying, when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? But we look at that, too. If we are not happy, like, like the gal in the video presentation that said, he looks so sad all the time. I wonder what's happening. We really have to look at our mood. So, if you're rushed, they're rushed. If you're upset, they're upset. If you're happy, they're more likely to be happy. That's the key thing. I remember a training that I received that long ago that always told me when I ever I entered anybody's home or any establishment, that all of my baggage I left on the doorstep outside, and when I walked in, I had no baggage with me. So I could be the happy-go-lucky gal, I'm pretty happy in, in general, but you know, I, when I enter somebody's home or I enter a facility or a community, I'm not going to bring my baggage with, you, with me. I will leave it on the doorstep, and then when I go to leave, I'll just pick up that bag and take it right with me. I'd like to leave it, but you know, it doesn't always happen. But we want to make sure that we are bringing the joy and the happiness that they deserve to have. We also want to check our body language. Remember we talked about that. Facial expressions. Check your mood. What's going on? Okay, the Patriots won the Super Bowl again. Either you could be happy about that, or you could be really angry. Because I know that I have friends that were both. <laughs> well, some friends were very happy, some friends were very angry. But you know, we can sit and carry on about that a month later now and say, does it really matter? In the moment, does it matter? Maybe when football season begins in the fall, maybe we'll see if it, if it matters. But right now, it doesn't matter. And then before engaging, this is a really good way to think. 
and help you to be happy is to think of something you love when you go into engaged care. And maybe that'll bring a different mood. I remember um, I was driving on the freeway, and you know, of course, freeway driving is always pleasant, and people were cutting me off and doing different things, and I was getting really mad, and I was starting to honk my horn, and I'm yelling in my car, you don't know how to drive, and, I, and the song came on, the radio, and it, made, it put me in a better mood, and so then I started just driving my car with the biggest smile on my face, like this, the whole time driving my car, and when somebody would cut me off, I would just laugh. <laughs> And it totally changed how I was when I got to my next spot. Because I just realized, I'm not gonna change their behavior. I can only change my own. And I have to really look at that too, is how, you know, I want to engage. Before I engage, I need to think of something I love. Another concept that was uh, created by uh, Naomi Fayo is called the validation therapy. And what she writes is says that she wants us to acknowledge the feelings of the person to say their feelings are true. On my way here today, in the hotel, I ran into George Clooney. He's in town. How many of you believe that? <laughs> nobody got up to go look. <laughs> so apparently nobody believed that. But if I said to you, and you knew that I had dementia, that I saw George Clooney earlier in the day, would it be better for you to tell me, no, you didn't? Or just to say, how fun, how was he doing? How was the twin? How's them all? You know, all these things, you know, thinking about that and, and understanding that. But that is really important to say, because remember, sometimes our behaviors too, or our expressions, there are feelings, there are thoughts, there are concerns, so we want to look at that. So we use what we call empathy to tune into our inner reality of that memory care person, memory impaired person. And so what we do then is we're building trust. Yes. Um, getting back to that validation, I have a question. Um, yeah. Um, my husband is really bad dementia. And he has been for a long time. And he has been dealing with that. And we were talking about, well, I just saw a photo of him and he was bad. Yeah, that's a hard one to deal with, with Louis body dementia. That's a whole other realm. Because that's like Parkinson's and, and Alzheimer's and everything all just intermingled together. And it's becoming very very popular, sad to say, more and more people are being diagnosed with that, and the hallucinations are rough. Mm -hmm. I remember my grandfather actually had Parkinson's disease, and, and he, we would get the call from the nursing facility that he lived in at the time, this was a long time ago, that he would be sitting at three o'clock in the morning at the entrance of his room with, a, with his gun, keeping watch. And you know, of course he had no physical rifle in his hand, but he was keeping watch, and the, and the staff were like, what do you want us to do? Go and have a conversation. I don't know if this would always work every time, but find out what the person's doing. You can ask the questions. That's what Naomi likes to look at, is you ask who, what, where, and when. You never ask why, though, with the person who's going through that hallucination process. So you can ask those questions, maybe to gauge a conversation, so that maybe they get to the point of realizing and they get through that hallucination period that it was that it was that the hallucination. That can be very challenging, yes, and very tricky with the living body dementia. So thank you for bringing that up, you know, and then understanding how you can work with that. But when you sit there and have a calm conversation, which may be hard to do when they're, that helps to build the trust. And then maybe when that next occurrence happens, they're able to communicate with you even better. And you know, and sometimes does he recognize who you are every time? Does he know who you are? That's good. That's good. So, but when it gets to that point too, that's going to be challenging. That's going to be the next challenge that he'll face. You know, having to reintroduce yourself to him every time. Because believe it or not, we all look. We are not who we looked like 20, 30, 40 years ago. I know. Can you believe that? It's a shock, isn't it? It just told you something very shocking. Even when we look at the mirror, we're like, who is that person staring back at me? And then when the individual doesn't recognize us anymore, that's going to be even more of a challenge. Because they may recognize who you were 30 years ago, because that's where they are. Remember, that's why I said it's important to know where their mindset is. That's challenging. But try to ask the questions, who, what, when, where, how, but no why. And when we do that, it helps to reduce their stress and renews their feelings of worth, and it also restores their dignity. That is the key thing here too. Remember, people living with dementia are people, and they have dignity and they have the rights, and we have to respect those 
than you're being less busy. Yes? What happens if you do ask why? I'm very, I won't say why. So that, and, and <laughs> yeah. So why can become very uh, defensive. And when a person is asked me why, like why? We don't know why. We don't know why, and we become we become very angry that you would ask us such a question. And that increases and escalates the behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, good. So music. Ah. I, I just had a conversation about this. There's this video now going around on Utah and uh, Facebook that I love. It is these, there's an instrument called a boom whacker. Any of you ever heard of a boom whacker? So it's a tube, and it, and it plays musical notes. And depending on the length of the tube, it'll play the different notes. And they are in tune to the key signature on the piano and everything. And there was this, this uh, video going around just recently of this group of college students sitting in a huge safe circle, probably 30 or 40 of them, playing the Bohemian Rhapsody on the boom whacker. It is amazing how they can do it. They do the entire song. That's how long it is. And we, and you can hear, because they're boot whacking it, so there's no vocal, you can hear the audience starts to sing the words along. Oh, that's amazing. And so you can kind of hear the words, and then everybody's just yelling, ba ba, you know, ooh, ooh. Everybody's even doing the oohs while they're going through the song. And it's just very uh, funny to me, because music is the universal language. I think of an old song that George Frederick Handel wrote about music. Art thou troubled, music will calm thee. Art thou weary, rest shall be thine. Music is the source of all gladness, it heals all sadness. Mm -hmm. And we think about that, it is the key language that everybody can understand. Now I have a little homework assignment for you, because I just discovered this in the last five days. It's on YouTube. How many of you know how to go to YouTube? I'm here, everybody knows how to go to YouTube. <laughs> Type in the song A Minute Man. Anybody ever heard that before? Song a minute man. So song a minute man. Song a minute man. And you'll watch this video of a gentleman who's in his later stages of Alzheimer's disease and he can sing every single Frank Sinatra song known to man. His son, and he is amazing. Have you seen it yet? He is amazing. His talent is so strong through and through and he just sings. There's no conversation with him. There's zero communication. But when you turn the music on, he comes alive. And it is awesome. The song of Minute Man. I love it. I just discovered it this week. I had not heard of it, and it was just so cool to see how we look at that. But it offers such a comfort and therapy to the suffering from brain damage. There has been proven fact, too, that individuals who suffer from stroke and have lost their ability to speak can sing the music too. And they're able to sing any song you put in front of them or play for them, but they can't speak at all after the music stops. I had a lady that I was able to teach her how to sing her words so that she could communicate. We worked with a speech therapist on that and it was so exciting to see her come alive because she could talk again. It was through music she was able to express herself. That is how important music is. Neil Mateo, who I talked about earlier with validation therapy, uses music all the time and how it can bring people back to, to life, so to speak. It has such a profound influence on everybody. Think about that. How many of you remember the song that was played at your wedding? The wedding song. Yeah? Exactly. We all know that. And then what do you think about? Everybody's face kind of went brightened up a little bit when they thought about it, too. They thought about the song, they thought about the dance maybe, or maybe a prom date where there was a song that played. Or if the radio comes on and there's a song that plays, I mean, I think of, you know, you, obviously you can figure out my era, I think of like Death Leopard or, or Journey, you know, just a small town girl, <laughs> living in a lonely world, and everybody just goes crazy. Or, you know, at first I was afraid, I was petrified. <laughs> and we realize that we all get going and we all sing. We know every single word of the song. Whether, whether it's the right word or not, we're still singing the words along, right? Or I did it my way, or whatever the case may be, you know, looking at that. So when memory fails, music speaks. That's the key thing there. And music is the source of all gladness. It heals all sadness. And so music can be an awesome thing to bring in. That's why it's good to know their preferences, too. What kind of music do they love? 
When my father passed away, we were going through his belongings and looking at that, and he had an entire room basically filled with tapes and CDs. And we could not believe what an eclectic collection he had. He had so many operas and musical show tunes, because I grew up loving the show tunes. We watched every single uh, Broadway show in our home, you know, and when they would come out on, like I can remember Rodgers and Hammerstein, everything, you know, doing all of that. We would sing and dance in our home. That's what we always did, and it was so fun. And just seeing his collection, and then I'm like, Born on Blondes. My dad had the disc of Born on Blondes. Now, anybody know who Born on Blondes are? <laughs> 25 years of my life is still trying to get up that 90s band. Great big deal of love. And I'm like, why did he have that? And I realized it was because it was one of the bands that I listened to. And he wanted to have that in his collection so he could understand me better. And I thought that was really, yeah, touching because it just really helped me to understand that music can bring so much to the, to the table. So as we move beyond those games and the puzzle, we, re we recognize how vital it is to engage in as many opportunities as we can to create those moments of pleasure or joy. And we also look at how we can decrease that anxiety and irritability, even in ourselves. That's the key thing there. And we have these opportunities to foster these connections that we otherwise would not get. And we also allow for that self-expression, like music does. We can sing, we can dance, we can do whatever, and it's, it's, it's liberating, so to speak, because we can be free to behave how we want to behave when a song comes on. So these are things that you may be familiar with or may not. Folding laundry, it can be very therapeutic, believe it or not. I know as much as sometimes we may not enjoy that task. I know as, as a housewife, laundry is probably one of our least favorite tasks. We always enjoy it when it's in the washer and in the dryer and there's nothing going on in between, right? But I really find folding laundry therapeutic. I have a system on how I do it. I'll probably be terrible down the line, you know, when it comes to my systems of how I fold laundry. But it can be really fun also to sort socks, finding the matching socks and different things, folding towels, kitchen towels, also really good. <coughs> Cooking and baking, we talked about apple pie already, but there's so many other things that we can engage in. Almost every entertainer has a, has a cookbook out there now, and we can look at that and figure out ways to do that. Gardening. Very therapeutic. Now I know in Vegas it may be difficult to do this, but uh, I've, I've heard of great success stories of people having successful gardens in our valley despite the heat and the dry, the dry soil. You have to export some soil in. But if you think about just potting plants, how many of you dug through the dirt, dirt of potting a plant? It's kind of cool feeling, isn't it? Cold, therapeutic, right there. And so that is why it's really good to bring in the gardening aspect. The newspaper, I talked about the newspaper earlier, but one of my favorite things to do is to go through the coupons and look at them and maybe cut them out and think, you know, maybe I'll go to this store or the Tuesday when the, when the ads come out for all the grocery stores. Going through them, looking at the coupons. I had a neighbor that I worked with that lived down the street from me that um, passed away about a year ago now. And he went through every, every Tuesday, he would go pick up the mail at his mailbox and go through all of the ads of all the different grocery stores. And he, on Wednesday, he made his trip to four or five different grocery stores so he could get the best deal. But it was an activity for him. He enjoyed doing that. And it brought him pleasure, and it brought him joy. His wife used to get really frustrated with him. I don't know why, because she, you know, would always be in the driver's or the passenger seat, and she would just go along for the ride. But he had fun doing it, and there was nothing wrong with that. And they really enjoyed it. And then towards the end of his life, when he could no longer drive, she would have to drive, and she was not always the driver. So it was really challenging for her to be the driver, but he still wanted to go do what he enjoyed doing. He may not have made it to his four or five stops in the day towards the end because he was tired more frequently, but at least he was able to still enjoy doing it. He still, and then he would come over to my house. I can't get to the store, but here's this coupon. Go get this deal. It's great. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's do it. Photo collages. You know, putting together photo albums is so fun to do too because and that brings a whole other opportunity of reminiscing. I talked about that earlier too, but bringing the opportunity to talk and communicate and say, oh my gosh, this is a funny story. You will not believe what happened in this picture. My husband had a very um, challenging childhood. His mother died when he was four. 
His stepmother, first stepmother died when he was nine, and his second stepmother died when he was 18. So he really had very little time with an actual mom. And I remember when we, we were dating and, and getting together, um, by the way, I've been married twice, just so you know. These are true stories. Because <laughs> I said that after the fact that I took care of my mother-in-law, um, uh, my second husband. And he also was in the military, so he never had a ton of stuff with him. And so I remember when we got together and then we were married and we were going through our things, you know, of course, he had nothing, no memories of his childhood in the form of pictures. And his older sister put together, they had, we had like a big family reunion like a year into our marriage, and we went down and I got to meet all his cousins and people that I never even had heard of, and they had this video that they put together and had put all the pictures in on the video. And so we sat there and watched it, and it probably went on for about 40 minutes, and it was awesome to finally have the opportunity to see his childhood come to life. And even his eyes were beaming, and there was the greatest picture of him, and this explains so much about him. He had in his hand, he was about three years old, and they would a piece of watermelon that was this big. And he had one in this hand and one in that hand. And you could see in the picture, it was a video actually of him chewing on both hands and then this, the, the juice just dripping down his face. And he says, and that's why I love watermelon. He said, and it was just the cutest photo of him that we had never seen. He, had, he didn't even know that it was a video. He didn't even know the video was taking place. But it offered an opportunity for a reminiscing and to have a joyful moment in his life. And how fun that was to really uh, get to know him a little better too on that different level. <clears throat> so I wanna finish with just this final thing here. And you guys didn't even tell me I've gone this far. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just wanna finish with what this is called the quality of life ethos. And this just helps us to understand the process here. That we wanna champion the belief that your loved one can grow, learn, and develop as long as they're alive. We want to develop a community that empowers them to, to be in the world around them. That we want to touch the hearts, minds, and spirits of them together so that we can forge a positive relationship. We want to challenge the negative stereotypes of aging and disability by relating to the elders with a valuable legacy of wisdom and experience. We want to enrich the environment by infusing daily life with beautiful meaning, learning, joy, and pleasure. We want to assist our loved ones to function at their highest possible level despite physical, psychosocial, or spirituality, disability, loss, or age. We want to protect the daily living skills and cognitive function by engaging them with honesty, respect, and encouraging choices in their daily life. And then we want to advocate, teach and advocate for those that can't. We want to nurture with warm closeness of our friendship and connect the past and the future by building a meaningful relationship. Beautiful. Love that one. So if you have any questions, I'll, I'll take them now, but I appreciate everybody's uh, attention here. Thank you. Yes, over here. One more thought. So what he was saying over there, if you couldn't hear, was that he had his mother-in-law record her personal history, basically, onto tape, and now it's on CD, and everybody can enjoy listening to it. What a great moment of joy right there. Does she listen to him still today? Oh, she passed away. Did she listen to him? I'm sorry. Did she listen to him still? Yeah. That's awesome. And the music. Yes. Incredible. Music. That's a great, that's actually a project called Music in Memory that is a really big 
top subject in the world. And you can watch a video called The Lion and Sun with Henry as well. So tell us I thought it screams with him, brought him to life. So it's Henry, alive inside with music and memory. Great, thank you so much for sharing that about your mother. And I'm just sorry that she passed. Thank you. Appreciate we have time that. for one more, one more question. question. No one? Everybody wants me to tap dance now, sure. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Before you leave, there are snacks in the back. Please take some for your trip back home. Thank you.